Well, it's been a very interesting two weeks. I don't know why y'all weren't here last Sunday. <laughs> but I do want to talk to you about a few things that I think will help give uh, a perspective on a few of these items. First of all, I want you to take your Bible, turn very quickly to the book of Exodus. We've got a lot of things to cover this morning. And uh, I'm not a slow preacher. I just have to wait on slow turners. So if you'll kind of step it up a little bit, that would help. The book of Exodus in chapter 14. And the church Bible is on page 87. The Bible tells us that there's a story written about an east wind that came and, believe it or not, just kind of pulled the water back and made it dry and people could walk across on it. And then the water came back in. Now, we've never lived in our time when we've ever seen anything like that, have we? I think we have. I think, really believe it or not, I believe that uh, we were blessed with a miracle. But here in the book of Exodus in chapter 14, uh, 14 look in verse 18. Just a couple verses, verse 18. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillars of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind, for, uh, behind them. And it came between the camp and the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud. God's in charge of the cloud. And darkness to them. But it gave light by night to these. So that the one cannot near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the east to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. I believe there's a story similar in the Bible that what we have seen and experienced, but not everybody sees things the same way. There's a human perspective and a divine perspective and it all depends on where you are. So uh, if you'll look there in your notes, are the acts of God making a divine statement? Now, insurance companies probably can give you a good definition of what acts of God are. I uh, want to tell you what I believe that's uh, found in the Word of God. The first uh, statement I have in bold, it is natural for a man to question the reasons why storms hits a particular area and not another. Is it all about nature or nature's God? Now, if you're just totally scientific, don't believe in God, then you can believe, well, it's just nature. But maybe it's nature's God. The head of FEMA says that Hurricane Irma could be the worst storm of any century. That's what they said. Millions of people were evacuated, millions housed in shelters, many hospitals and senior citizens' homes closed, and homes and businesses were boarded up and braced for the storm. The media covered this story, that was covering the story, finally took a break from the Russians hacking into the election. So there are some good things that can come out of this. Irma and Harvey are neither Republican or Democrat or independent hurricanes. They're apolitical. They are concerned acts of God. Are considered acts of God. These are not accidents caused by man, but acts of God that are beyond the control of man. An act of God is an unforeseeable natural phenomenon explained by describing an event which involves no human activity or agency, which is not realistically possible to guard against, which is due directly and exclusively to natural causes, and which could not have been prevented by any amount of foresight, plans, and care. Now, that's what I understand those acts of God to be. Why we want insurance coverage. Look at the next statement. A little question. Maybe get you to think a little bit. Can the actions of man determine the actions of God? Now some people say yes, some people say no. I mean how can a little old person on the earth influence a big great mighty God that created the heavens and the earth? But how many of y'all have ever prayed in your life? Let me see him. Evidently, you believe it. You believe that you, one little individual, can influence God to do something, one way or the other. Or why did you pray? So do we believe that God can 
respond to whatever we want, how we pray. Interesting. It was on the news last night. It was even in the paper. And it was talking about how all this is blamed upon global warming. And mainly because Donald Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement Accord. <laughs> if he hadn't have done that, we would have never had these two hurricanes. Now, I have a problem with that. And I'm sure you probably would, too. We're going to blame it on global warming. Have you ever heard of the flood during Noah's time? You ever heard of Noah and the flood? Anybody ever heard of that? Let me see your hand. Yeah. All right. Caused by global warming. <laughs> do you believe that? Or do you believe that God may have brought the flood? And you know what else he did after that flood? The rainbow was God's promise to never flood the world again. So all of those who believe in warm, uh, uh, climate warming, don't worry. He will never flood this world again. Oh, maybe a little police is here and there. We've had somebody head to church. And that little water hole I hear some uh, overflow. You're going to have local things, yes, but you're never going to have another world flood. I don't care how warm the world gets. Now, you're talking about the greatest judgment in the world, this last hurricane. No storm is like this. Uh, and God says, I got one coming. It's called the Great Tribulation Period. You can see anything like it yet. He says there's never been a time like it before. There'll never be a time like it afterwards. And you're talking about climate change? Hailstones of 120 pounds? Heat that's going to burn your skin? God describes all kinds of things that are going to happen. And the earth rocking back and forth as a drunk man? It's going to be bad news. One third of the world is going to be burned up by fire? Or a nuclear blast. You see, we're living in very interesting and exciting times. But the Bible says men's hearts failing them for fear. Seeing those things that are coming upon the earth. You and I don't have to live in fear. Because we know sooner or later we're all going to die. And when we die, we get to be with the Lord. So you may lose your house here. But I told him in Sunday school class. You ought to see the mansion I got on the other side. I don't have to worry about hurricanes, cyclones, tornadoes, earthquakes, fire. It's all insured for eternity. And I can never lose it. So there's things you may lose in this world, but there's some things you can never lose. And we'll talk about that a little bit. I wrote this big statement in here. If global warming was a result of man's deeds, was it then an act of God? Hmm, interesting, just to think about it. Draw your conclusion from what the Word of God has to say. And I just put a couple of verses in here just to kind of uh, ease into the subject on the next page, which you have not yet turned to. <laughs> Bottom of the page, 115 Psalms 3 says, But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Do you believe that? You gotta, you're supposed to believe the Bible. You believe the Bible? Yeah. Daniel 4.35 says, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, hey, what are you doing? Why'd you do that? Can you dictate to God? Number one, does the scripture anywhere really say that God controls the weather? Now, for some of you, I even put in here the page number, if you want to use the page number. But there's some scriptures here that I do want you to see. So look there in Exodus chapter 9. You're already in Exodus. Just turn back a couple pages. Exodus chapter 9. And look at verse 22. This is when Moses went down to Egypt. And I just want you to see. We say we believe the Bible, the Old Testament. Then there must be somebody who's in charge. Who knows what's going to happen a, a day later or two days later, three days later. What's going to happen? That's prophecy. In verse 22, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, upon man and upon beast and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his hand, or rod, toward heaven, 
And the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along among upon the ground, and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt, so that there was hail and fire mingled with hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt, since it became a nation. And the hail smote thereof throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail smote every herb of the field and break every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. You think there's a reason? God was doing something. God was saying something. Can the acts of God be a divine awareness? And verse 27, and Moses, or Pharaoh, sent Call for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. Now, he did the other times too. The Lord is righteous and I and my people are wicked. Do you think how people lived had anything to do with what was happening? When you read the scripture, just draw your conclusion from what the Bible says. Or whatever will be, will be, and there's nobody in charge up there. I mean, God may have created the earth, but he took a vacation. He don't even know what's going on. You know, I draw you. You see how big heavens are? I mean, he's busy. Somebody said, during the storm, I couldn't get out. But God texts me. And we're moving right along. But all of this is so important for you to realize there are important verses about what God says in his word about weather. Look at the next scripture. Just look there in your notes there because we will not take time to cover all of these. Psalms 135 verse 5 says, For I know that the Lord is great, that our Lord is above all gods. Whatsoever the Lord please, that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas, and in all deep places. Now look at the next part of the verse. He causes the vapors to ascend from the end of the earth. He maketh lightning for the rain. He bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. I believe God's still on the throne, and I believe God's in charge. Not only do I believe that God is in charge, I believe God is in control. See, some people, you can be in charge of something but not be in control. Look at the next statement. Jeremiah 10, 12. This is a verse that we often use to show the equals, e, e equals mc square, that matter is created out of energy, where God is able to create matter, the earth, out of his power. See there? He hath made the earth matter out of his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretions. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapor to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightning with rain and bringeth forth the winds out of his treasure. In Nahum, chapter 1, verse 2, on page 952, we won't take the time to look at it, but look at these scriptures. You can look at them later. God is jealous, and God does not like to be replaced by anything, anyone, anybody, any other gods, made man, man-made or whatever. God does not want to be replaced. God wants you to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. And God does not appreciate it when somebody else puts something else in God's place. And one way to find out whether or not you're putting something in God's place, if God took away everything that you had, does God still have his place in your life? There's a song we used to sing all the time in ranch and in camps. Christ is all I need. Anybody ever heard that song? Christ is all I need. All I need. How do you know? How do you know that's true? Let him take away everything you have. And see, is he all you really need? Or you fall apart because the world's falling apart. Look what he says. He makes a statement here in Nahum. God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. God does not want to be replaced. So if you understand, there is a righteous, holy God. And he looks down, and you'll see that God has many times used storms, weathers, anything, because God is in control of it, to either bless a nation, chasten a nation, even an individual, as you'll see in a moment. Look at the next verse. 
The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and in the clouds are the dust of his feet. God says he hasn't surrendered his authority over anything. When we pray and we ask for a miracle, all we're asking God to do is to stay the natural force of something that's set up because of working according to nature's laws. You see, there are certain laws that, you know, if I plant this seed and I cover it up, gets a little water on it, and then something's going to grow. But God can override any of his laws that he wants. He can suspend things. He can cause a man that walks upon the earth, and because he pleased God, he was and he was not. And all of a sudden, he disappeared. Or Elijah was caught up in a whirlwind himself. The law of gravity has just been suspended. Now, God can do all of that. The natural man has any weight. When he tries to walk on water, he's going to sink. But God, he can suspend that. And he can walk on the water. You try it. And you'll find out that God is still in charge. And God says the storms, the earthquakes, all these things are to show the power, the wonderful works of God. It's not just the stars and the heavens and so forth and the sun and the moon and in the earth itself. It's the things that happens because many scriptures refers to the storms that reveal the power of God. Because it's power you and I can't control. Doesn't mean it's out of control. But what else he says? In verse 5, the mountains quake and the hills melt. The earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. If you read and study the Bible, you'll find out that God is in charge. We may not agree with all the things God does. But God doesn't have to always give us an explanation. I used an illustration with the college kids the other day. If I was to say, um, Trina, go up there and close that window. And she says, why? A natural teenage response. Because I said so. No. Why? Because there's a hurricane coming, and the window's open. It's going to flood everything in your room. Oh. She needed a reason. Now, Daddy may give her an explanation, but God may let things happen in your life and not tell you why. But it doesn't mean that God does not have a justifiable reason for what he does. Because God is perfect and cannot make mistakes. God is in control. Now, the last verse there, verse 6. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? Look at number 2. God controls the skies and the rain. In Psalm 77, I've taught these verses many times. I like to take 77 and 78 in Psalm 73 and put those psalms together and, and teach a wonderful message. Or oh, because when I looked at the prosperity of the wicked, my foot had well nigh slipped. But until I came into the sanctuary of the Lord, then I understood the end. In other words, don't worry about how much everybody has or how much nobody has. Because things come and things go. With some people that are rich and people that are poor, most of them are just changing places. They had it, now they've lost it. They didn't have anything, now they got it. There's people just like that, like a bunch of yo-yos. The things of this world are all going to be lost. You're going to lose everything. God has a way of trying to keep us focused on eternal values. God controls the skies. He controls the rain. He says, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God is our God. Until you go into the place of the presence of God and listen to what his word has to say. <coughs> the reason you want people to go, go to the word, get in the book, go to the, because this is the word of God. This is coming into the presence of God. Because here you're listening to what God, God I'm in his presence. I want to hear his voice. This is his voice. This is his word. This is God's word. So you go to the word of God and you find out, and then you begin to understand a lot more than you do by just, 
Well, I don't know. It just seems to me, and, and you say, it's just natural. Everything just happened. There's no reason for it. No, no. You know, it's just that uh, God has a place for the sun to move and the, uh, the uh, circle that he has to make. And this talks about in the book of uh, 19 Psalm. Or it talks about the, the path in the sea. and talks about the storms and the currents and all these things. It, it's just natural. And they're saying that God is set in nature. And so because you can't see God, you just accept what you see. But by faith, you'll find out there's a God behind these things. And God can use things and powers that lie beyond anything we can imagine. And we can't stop it. Look at the next statement. Page three, as Paul Harvey would say. Psalm 77, verse 15 says, Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. Because he's talking about when he went and brought them out of Egypt. And across the Red Sea, and it caused that thing to spread open. Verse 16, the water saw thee, O God. The water saw thee. They were afraid. The depths also were troubled. The clouds poured out water. The sky sent out a sound. Thine arrows also went abroad. The voice of thy thunder was in the heavens. The lightnings lighteneth the world. The earth trembled and shook. You see, God said all these things shows his majesty, his power, his wonder. And then he says in verse 19, there's a three or four things that I just kind of highlighted here because I want you to see this. Thy way is in the sea. In other words, God can use the sea to accomplish his purpose. The great waters, he says, and thy path is in the great waters. And thy footsteps are not known. In other words, when you and I, we say, I want to walk with the Lord. I want to follow the Lord. Well, if he walks in the sea, remember, you cannot Trace the steps in the sea. There's no tracks left. And though other people have walked before us, and they have lived with the Lord and walked with the Lord, and as it says in the scriptures, and they walk with God, they walk with God, they walk with God. But when you get ready to walk with God, you've got to walk with God. It's not everybody else. It's a personal thing between you and God. And you can't always follow somebody else's footsteps. You're going to have to, by faith, walk and walk on water. In other words, by faith, trusting God that he's going to lead and guide you and bless you and protect you and, as we often say, give you praise and honor and glory one of these days. But for now, you've got to trust in his watch, care, love, and provision. Look at the next statement. The storms declare the mighty strength of God's power. Now, God controls the wind. There's a story where God uses this. He explains it in Mark chapter 4, verse 37. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, and that it was now full. Now, he had told them to get in the boat and go on the other side, and they did. Did Jesus know about the storm coming? He not only made the storm, he sent the storm. He sent the storm right where they were. Did God know that? And he says here in verse 38, And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. They wake him and said unto him, Master, and here's the point, carest not that we perish? Do, do you not care whether we live or die? Don't you care about us? When you see a storm of life, maybe you'll question whether, God, do you, do you really love me? You could have stopped this. Think about all the people who lost their homes, and yet you may be here and you didn't lose your home. And all the people that lost the power, and yet you didn't lose your power. You have electricity. You're enjoying the air condition. This church didn't lose anything. We didn't get one drop of water inside. And God was good to us. And God was bad to them. God has a reason, though you may not understand it. Though I may not understand it. But aren't you glad that no physical life of our people was lost? A lot of things may be lost. A lot of things you don't have to understand. But you're to believe that there is a God, and you're supposed to always thank the Lord and praise the Lord. And what if you only had today what you were thankful to the Lord for yesterday? And God knows how to work in our lives. He knows what every individual needs. And I believe God gives every individual 
individual care and attention. But look what he says here. In verse 39, and he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, peace be still. He can cause it to start and to stop. He says he can. Now, either he can or he can't. But what does the Bible say? And then in verse 40, he said unto them, why are you so here on the line that? Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? No faith in what? He had already told them to go to the other side. Evidently, they already knew God had promised them he'd meet them on the other side. And they were supposed to be on the other side. They questioned, Don't you, we're going to perish. In other words, we're not going to make it. But he had already given his word. You'd be surprised how God can allow things to happen in your life to see whether or not, do you really trust him with your life? Do you really love him more than you do your house? You say, yes, I do. Or if he took your house, you still love God, right? You're not bitter at God. You're not mad at God. You're not mad if he takes your home or if he takes your car. What if, what if he took your health? <clears throat> what if he took your wife? What if he took your kids? Do you love the Lord more than anything else in this world? It's always going to be, in everything you have in life, a test of your love. The trial of your faith. The trial of your faith. What do you love? And do you really want God to see how strong you are? I got a few things, and I hope I can get to them in time this morning. Look down at number four. God upholds and sustains the universe. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Everything is under God's power. Even the devil can only do what God permits him to do. God doesn't make him do anything. God uses. God does not make you serve him, but God will allow you to serve him. If, if you don't, there may be consequences. God will not make you trust him as your savior. God will allow you to reject Christ, reject God, reject everything that you want. God will allow you to die. God will allow you to go to hell. But that ain't what he wants. He wants you to go to heaven. And he says, whosoever believeth. So it's whosoever will believe it. God will not make you believe. God will not make you serve. God will not make you honor him. But there's consequences to your decisions. And your decisions, in many cases, affects the decision that God makes. Notice down at the bottom. God has power over the clouds. Out of the south cometh the whirlwind and the cold out of the north. By the breath of God, frost is given. Verse 11. Also by water, and he wearieth the thick cloud, he scattereth his bright cloud. He is turned around about by his counsels, it is, that they may do, get this, whatsoever he commanded them upon the face of the world in the earth. Now, if this is true, then none of these things are accidents. Are they acts of God? Or God doing things because of people? I hope insurance company never figure out what I'm talking about here. Look at the next statement. He causes it to come. Whether for, and get this, this is right there in your Bible. He causes it to come, whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. But God has a reason. You may not always discern it. You may not discern why God will let one house and everybody dies and another house right beside him and everybody lives. I called up the other day to see how Jim Scudder was doing because I know he has a place down there in the Keys. And he has a little place. Not a big place, a little place right on the canal there. And he's got a boat there and the water, and it's just a beautiful little place. And I've been there. We, we've been there. Stayed with him. So we, um, I couldn't get a hold of him because his cell phone wasn't working or something. So I called up there and talked to his son. And he says, uh, Mom and Dad, they, they flew up there on a Thursday, and they got there safely. And so they checked with their house down there, and, and they said, nothing. No water. Nothing else. And a half a mile from them, everything was totally wiped out. 98, 95%. Everything was totally wiped out. And here says Jim Scudder, and his place not touched one iota. Right there on the water, and nothing happened to him. Now, let's just stop and think for a minute. Is it possible that here we had, and all the experts were saying, Irma is coming right for Tampa. And you watched that thing, and you were all watching, and it came right up. And lo and behold, the water was being 
taken out of the bay. Anybody ever seen this? It was on the news. The water was going away. And they said, it's going to come in 10, 15 foot. Storm surge. And that means it's going to be about 7, 8 feet high in this auditorium. Our home was going to be totally wiped out. And how many other places? So people had a little fear, justifiable fear. But that storm came up, that water went out. And then when it goes out, then that wind comes back around and the back part catches it, going to pull it in here, and here it comes, a big old wall. But the thing is, though, when the water went out, the thing came this way, and by the time the wind came around, there was no water in there. And there was no storm surge. Now, do you believe that it's possible for God because of people praying? I had people who contacted me on Facebook and texted me all over this country. I don't, people I don't even know. But they hear about the radio program. They know we're on YouTube. And, and people would contact me. We're praying for you. We're praying for you. Praying for you. Now, I will chalk it up to this. Not perhaps because we're so holier than somebody else. But there could be a lot of people who were praying for us. And I would venture to say, y'all were praying also. And you were thrilled to death that you were spared. And so because of that, you can be thankful to the Lord. Because I think that wind, east wind, throwing it out. Well, that's just like there in the Bible. There were people out there walking in the bay. They showed it. So we have a lot to be thankful for. Is God in charge? I do believe so. Uh, look down here at the bottom of the page. What can we learn from fires, earthquakes, and hurricanes, and tornadoes, and floods? Number one, if the Bible is true, we should accept as a fact, God is not only in charge, but in control. Can you check that off? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Number two, God being perfect can only have a justifiable reason why he may not reveal to us, or which he may not reveal to us. Do you believe that that's a possibility of being true? God can, because he's perfect, God can only have a justifiable reason, though he may not tell us why. Number three, many things lie beyond the control of man. Have you found out that some things lie beyond your control? That you can't control everything? Wouldn't you like to? That's why some people, they don't trust anybody. I'm a self-made man. I do it all myself. And they all they trust is themselves. Um, number four, very important one. The first word is fear. Fear of the unknown. Unknown consequences. When you may not know what's going to happen, how bad is it going to be? And if you listen to all the experts telling us how bad it was going to be, there's going to be a number four or five hurricane, and by the time it got here, what was it, one or two, something like that. But if it had been that bad, if they had been right, do you realize how devastated this county would be? This place called Tampa? And from what I heard, this is the worst place in all of America for flooding because we're so close to sea level. This church is not even four feet above sea level. And the bay is right down here. How bad would it have been? Did you know, just in case we try to make as much preparation that we could, we couldn't find enough sandbags because everybody was getting them. We're just going to stack them in front of the door and stack them in front of that door and back there because, you know, if water got in on that floor, what it would do to that tile in that floor? And all the stuff and all the walls, what it would have done to the carpet, it would have been above these, uh, these pews. Do you realize how much damage would be done? Do you realize because of the cost of wind damage and then the... Uh, a hurricane and the floods, all, all that would have cost us so much money that we didn't even carry the insurance on that. I told the deacons, if they think it's going to blow down, burn it. We had, we had fire insurance. 
just in case. <laughs> but we did what we could in order to prepare the best we could. Now, did you make any preparations at your home of any kind? If you did, raise your hand. Let me see your hand. That's just about everybody in. Somehow or other, you made some preparation. You might have went and got some sandbags. You might have nailed up some uh, windows, and you, you might have uh, got some uh, extra batteries and uh, a few things and the food and whatever, but you tried to get whatever you could because you were trying to play it safe just in case. You want to prepare. You wanted to have, that's insurance, the best you could achieve. Did you know that in spite of all of our preparation, some things lies beyond our power to control. We could have done everything we could have and still lost everything. A storm could have come in here and wiped out everything we have and took our lives also. You have car insurance. You'll get home insurance. You'll get health insurance. Did you know there's another kind of insurance that you need to be aware of? Got a clue what that is? Eternal life insurance. This is where the premiums have already been paid. And all you've got to do is accept it. There are no monthly payments to make. And it's guaranteed for life. Guaranteed. Won't cost you a dime to get it. Wouldn't you like to have an insurance policy like that? And you'll be guaranteed a home that will never be destroyed. A body that will never have to worry about food. You'll never have to worry about the dark. You'll never have to worry about any of those things because, see, the best insurance in all the world is to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's why I trusted Christ as my Savior years ago. I needed fire insurance. I did not want to go to hell. And I had never heard how to go to heaven. Nobody ever told me. They just told me I was going to hell. <laughs> but nobody told me how to go to heaven. Finally, one day, a man, sit down with me and explained it to me. It was the best news I ever heard. Now, remember, I wasn't raised in church. My daddy was a bootlegger, spent most of his life in the chain gang running from the law. My daddy, as I know of, didn't have a Bible. We never had a Bible in our home. And we didn't have prayer, and we didn't go to church. So my parent never taught me about the things of God. I was 18 years on the other side. Wondering, wanting to know, but nobody ever took the time to tell me. Let me show you something. This hand represents you and me. The wallet represents sin. We all have sin on us. God, he loves us. Now, even though he loves us, he hates our sin, but he loves us. He wants us to go to heaven. But because we've all sinned, God can't let us go to heaven and sin in heaven. Because if we go to heaven, we'll sin in heaven. And God doesn't want that. He, he has a perfect place. So because we've all sinned, the wages of sin is death. That's eternal separation from God in hell. But God loves us, wants us to go to heaven. And we have to be perfect, no sin. And God says you cannot earn eternal life. You cannot work your way to heaven. You see, that is an impossible storm that we have to face. And the consequences are eternal consequences. To be separated from God forever. One desire I have had all my life. 75 years. My one main desire is I want to meet God. I want to see him. I want to literally see him. And to realize that hell is to be eternally separated from God. I want to talk with him and walk with him. I mean to literally see him. I want to be where he is. But hell is to be eternally separated from God in a place of eternal fire. This hand representing Jesus Christ. He's God in the face. He came into the world because he loves us, hates our sin, because it separates us from him. See, it separates me from him, separates me this way. Jesus Christ, who had no sin, he didn't have to die. So he took all of our sins. We say we have to pay for it. He took it. He paid for it. And it says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He paid for our sins, came back from the dead. And God said, if we'll believe that he did it for us, he would put this payment to our account and we'd go to heaven on what Jesus Christ did for me. I believed it. 
I took out this insurance 57 years ago. I've never had to make one payment. I don't have to, I don't owe God anything. Because it, it was free. All the premiums all paid at one time. And this payment he made, he put it in an escrow account, and anybody who wants to draw on it can have it. In other words, if you want to go to heaven, all you got to do is believe that when he died, he died for you. And if you believe he died for you, he puts this payment to your account, you go to heaven on what he did. Your sins are paid. Your sins are paid. He already did it. But isn't it foolish for a person to reject something God's already done for him, and he can have eternal life and know that he's going to heaven when he dies? Look at the next statement down here. You see in verse 5, we covered it just a little bit while ago. Look in verse 6. In Jonah, one storm for one man produced great results in bringing many to the Lord. Do you realize because of one man who would not obey the Lord, God brought a storm? And here's some men in our boat, and they were fixing to die. God did all of that because here's one man that was rebellious. Now, can God... Bring a whole storm and a lot of people be in danger because God's trying to get the attention of one person. God, God. I just know that God can do whatever God wants to do. Now, he's limited himself on certain things. But he says this. In Acts, God used a storm to blow a ship off course so that Paul could reach some barbarians on an island. If that storm hadn't have come, Paul wouldn't have been on that island and Paul would not have won those people. Can God bring a storm in your life to get you scattered to someplace else and witness to somebody that you would have never had a chance to if you hadn't done it? I believe that. Because I believe, like Paul says, all these things have happened unto me for the furtherance of the gospel. For the furtherance of the gospel. And cause you to maybe to learn some things. And also I wrote down a couple of things here I want you to say. Look at number eight. Number eight, storms may cause the loss of things, security, and even life. That we may learn to pursue eternal things instead of temporary things. Do you know some people, their whole lives is based around the things that they possess. A man's life does not consist of the things that he possesses. There's more things, more important than that, and that's eternal things. And so sometimes God may use the storms, the fires, the floods to wipe away everything that you have. Because you, that, that's not what life's about anyway. Is what eternal values do you have? What treasures are you laying up in heaven where you cannot lose them? You cannot lose them. Things on the earth you can lose. When you came into this world, you came naked as a jaybird. And when you leave, you're going to leave just as empty and just as naked. Except for the robe of white. Look at the next statement. Number nine. Storms may reveal our true value and priorities while at the same time alerting us to the weaknesses in our own character. What happens to your attitude when the lines were long and you couldn't get gas and people were ready to start fisticuffs? Some of that happened, didn't it? And I bet some of it was some really strong Christian people too. Can Christian people who know the Lord and love the Lord lose it? I'm not going to ask for a raise of hand. Did you? <laughs> no. But it's possible. And then when you went to the grocery stores and all the food was gone, how'd you think it feel? You're mad at all those people who got there before you? Or did you get mad at anybody because, you know, your power went out and you didn't have electricity? And did they tell you to leave and you didn't leave? Because the possibility may be you won't have electricity. Or if you try to come back too soon, there may not be any gas. But you run the risk and you do what you do. Is it possible? Can you get upset? It happens even with believers, don't it? But it also can reveal weaknesses in your own character. Are you strong in the Lord? And sometimes we don't want to find out how weak we are. We don't want people to know how fearful we really are. But sometimes we are afraid. We don't have all the answers. We have that fear of the unknown consequences. Number 10, number 10. Storms may uproot us. Not just our home, not just the trees. Uproot us to spread good seeds due to the winds of adversity. God can allow a lot of things to happen in your life. It can build your character and cause you to 
see how strong you are or weak areas in your life where you're afraid or maybe you were not prepared. And next time they say, hey, there's another one coming and it's bigger and worse than the last one. This time you might even make better decisions. And maybe God gave you a warning this time and he'll spare those people in the keys, but really going to take us to the cleaners. Is that possible? Some people live and never learn. Look at the last point. The Lord may use storms to put some to sleep. What do you think I mean by that? And I don't mean taking a snooze. God can use storms to take a person's life. He can take a person's life to a, a car wreck, a plane, bad health, you know, cancer, leukemia, you name it. You're all going to die sometime, one day, if the Lord should tarry. So God can use a storm to take people out of this world, and he also can use a storm to cause people to wake up and realize how quickly life can be snuffed out and how important. What are your priorities in life? What are you living for? It might cause a person to examine themselves to see what God has for them and what are they doing because if I was to meet the Lord today, what would he have to say to me? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Or I'm sorry I had to bring you up here so early. You know how you were really messing up down here. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this little message. I don't know if it'll help you at all, but I don't have all the answers. But I do believe that God is in charge and God is in control. And God can use the weather to bring people to him or to chasten people, to teach us all kinds of lessons. Let's pray, shall we? Every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here this morning, maybe you have never trusted Christ as your Savior. God may be working in your life. A lot of things to get people to stop and listen, maybe to search. And if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you trust him right now? The only thing you have to do is when Christ died, believe he died for you, that he came back from the dead and says, I just want you to know that I did that because I love you. I did that because I paid for your sin, and I don't want you to go to hell, and I just want you to believe I did it for you. And if you'll believe that, God said he would give you as a free gift everlasting life. And he'd never cast you out and never lose you. I pray that you'll trust the Lord. God is powerful. God is real. He hasn't gone to sleep. He hasn't gone to bed. He hasn't gone on a vacation. He's watching. And he cares about you. You are important to him. If you've never trusted the Lord, would you do it right now? And I'm going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand. Raising your hand doesn't save you. It just lets me know that what I said made sense to you. You say, preacher, that made sense to me. And I will trust Christ as my Savior. And I'd like you to pray for me. Would you just slip it up very quickly? Put it right back down. Is anyone at all? Yes, God bless you, sir. Anyone else? Just slip it up, put it right back down. We're not going to pin you against the wall. I'm not going to embarrass you. But right where you're sitting. A man would be a fool to turn down a free gift. And once you trust Christ as Savior, you're God's child. God's child forever. And God can use many things to teach you, to bring you closer to him. Our Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Thank you for this individual who, by lifted hand, indicated he's trusting you as Savior. That once he trusts you, he never has to do it again because you give him eternal life. And Father, we also praise you and thank you for all the goodness that you've shown to us. That we've seen through storms, fires, and earthquakes, the mighty power, the wonderful works of God. And how that you can use these things for your honor and for your glory. Father, we may not understand it all. But in no way do we want to diminish the fact that you care about us and that you love us and that you want the best for us and that you have a justifiable reason for everything you allow. And we thank you for it in Christ's name we pray. Amen.